Welcome to the F1 Feeder Series podcast, your guide to keeping up to date on everything in the junior single seater world. I'm your host, Jim Kimberley, and this week we'll be catching up on the events in Dubai where Formula Regional Asia and F4 UAE continued on. We're going to hear a little bit more about some new driver signings over at Van Amersfoort and who the new recruit at Williams is. But I can't talk about any of this all by myself, so I'm delighted to say that with me I have Brazilian racer Gabriel Bortoletto, the friendly voice you've heard all weekend commentating, Jake Sanson, and as ever, F1 Feeder Series founder, Floris Visman. Uh, Floris, I generally go to you and say, how are you? But you're the, you're the, the bottom billing at the moment, so I'm going to say... <laughs> fair, <laughs> fair enough, fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> Gabriel, how are you? You're, uh, you're back in Brazil, I understand, with a, a trophy from Abu Dhabi. How's your year going? Hey guys, yeah, I'm perfect. I'm in Brazil right now. I'm back uh, like um, one week already. Uh, I'm here because I would do the stock car race in this this weekend. I would do the dual race, and uh, yeah, I'm I'm here to take some holidays, some rest with the family because I need to back to Europe soon. Yeah, and your uh, your Asian Championship was uh, successful, I'd call it. How did you view it? Yeah, it was it was quite good. I think uh, the first round was a bit better than the second one. We had some issues in the second round, but uh, still, we, we were always in the front, you know, in the qualifies and in the races. Uh, but in, in general, yeah, it was quite good. I'm happy. It's uh, I, I went there to to get more prepared for the season with the team, you know, because uh, it's a new team for me. I raced GP, and uh, to get uh, habituated with the engineer, mechanics, and everyone. But in general, I think. Uh, we, we got what we wanted there. It's uh, to get more feeling with everyone. And uh, I think we, we made a good job there. Yeah, it certainly looked like it. And when you turn up in Monza, they'll have a good lot of experience with a trophy to go with you. And Jake, you saw all of this unfold and a brilliant weekend again. Uh, Leclerc is surging in Formula Regional. How, how have you seen the championship go as a whole in this weekend? Uh, it's all been pretty exciting. Uh, it's been great to see how it's all uh, basically come together. It looks as though the racing is still going to be very close all the way to the end. Uh, I quite like the fact that uh, up to this point, no one driver has been able to win two races in a row, which has definitely made things uh, very entertaining. Uh, it's not done yet. There are still two weekends to go and things could still happen, but it's looking quite likely now that Arthur Leclerc has one hand on the trophy. His consistency has been pretty uh, incredible. So uh, very nice to see. Uh, F4 UAE is getting more and more exciting by the round as well. So that's uh, particularly uh, entertaining for everybody. So yeah, I think two more weekends left in the uh, United Arab Emirates is going to give us two very worthy champions. Yeah, looking looking that way, Leclerc is surging with was it every every race with a podium this weekend? Floris is looking untouchable. Would you say? Yeah, especially with the, the drivers uh, who are not doing a full campaign, uh, that makes it a little bit easier, uh, not really easy, of course, uh, but Leclerc, uh, yeah, he seems to be running away with it. He has a, like a big, big lead uh, and just a couple of like a couple of real contenders uh, left. Uh, Montoya won't be there. So, you know, uh, and, and a rookie uh, with Pepe Marti in, in second also, uh, he, who's done an exquisite job, by the way. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting. It's an interesting championship this year. Yeah, it really is. And there's some great drivers in there. Uh, I know, Gabriel, that it's not really going to be in your interest to big up some other drivers, but some of them include people you've raced against before. Who are you looking at who might be winning the championship in Asia this time around? Well, I think uh, Arthur is doing an amazing job to Will. Uh, I remember that uh, in the last race, he was, he was not so quick in the last race that I, I take part in Dubai, but he was amazing consistent, you know, he, he, he scored good points for the championship and also he could always be in the podium and in front and I think this is the main target for a championship because uh, now Montoya going out, me, David and a lot of people, I think it's more easier to him to, to score more points and win the championship and uh, he did an amazing job in this weekend getting three podiums it's quite good i think he's the favorite to win the championship yeah, yeah, it kind of has to be at this point and pepe marti we spoke about him before flores with uh just coming in with 
not really any expectations on him and Sergio was second place at the point, which is as a rookie. Um, Gabriel, how how is it to race against him? Have you are you rating Marty as one of the new Spanish talents? Gabriel, I need to be. <laughs> it was fun because in in Abu Dhabi uh, we were racing, you know, and I was P nine, no, I was P eight or something like this in the first race, and uh, I was doing the corner in G six and I got hit, you know, and I didn't know who it is. But uh, yeah, Pepe Marti just lose the breaking and uh, they, he hit me. But at some point, I didn't get pissed with him because he, he came into me after the race and say, oh, sorry, mate, you know, I'm getting confident with the car. I am coming for net four. And at the same point, we went into the stewards and I, I, I told the stewards, I, I say like, uh, he, they asked me and Pepe what happened. And Pepe say, oh, I lost the breaking point and I hit Gabriel. And I say, yeah, guys, for me, uh, I don't see anything why to get a, to to get a penalty for him. You know, he has already finished in P23 in the race because of the crash. Uh, he's just going to lose more positions. But I was not thinking he was quite fast like this in this championship. Then I just say, yeah, don't give a penalty for him. You know, he's coming from that for and everything. But then he starts to push, you know, and come really close to me. And I say, oh my God, maybe I needed that penalty. <laughs> but uh, it was quite good. <laughs> it's Thank impressive. You. He's coming for F4, you know, and there is a lot of FIA F3 drivers and also Freca drivers that are always on the top. And uh, he's doing an impressive job as well. He really is. Uh, you, you mentioned some penalties and penalties had some impact, Jake, with, uh, well, the weekend as a whole, but in particular, five second penalties in race one from the regional Asia. Um, five second penalties nudging people off the podium. How did you view all this go, going from a... Was it just start line infringements, right? Yeah, apparently. Um, it hasn't really been uh, explained in a massive amount of detail, but essentially what we gather from it is that the two cars were slightly out of line, which is actually something that's happened a few times at Dubai Autodrome. I don't know whether it's to do with the fact that the paint on the start line is slightly faded compared to the paint on the line at Abu Dhabi. Maybe that's got something to do with it, but it was something that was causing an issue in F4 UAE a couple, amongst a couple of the drivers as well as Formula Regional Asia. So potentially it might be down to that, but at the end of the day, the drivers have to take that kind of thing into account. So it was a bit unfortunate because the high-tech team had really got themselves into a brilliant double podium and particularly for Leonardo Fornaroli, you know, he had a brilliant build up to the weekend and it would have been nice, I think, for his confidence to have been able to clinch that third place finish. So very unfortunate that uh, both he and Isaac Hajar ended up uh, getting penalized. It was very confusing towards the end of the race because uh, we weren't entirely sure whether we had one more lap to go or not with the amount of time that was uh, left under the safety car. But uh, yeah, for the Mumbai Falcons to get a one, two, three, I was speaking to the team principal, Moy Tungagar, afterwards. And I said, there you see, I told you you could get a one, two, three at some point in the season. He said, yeah, but I didn't think we'd get one that quick. <laughs> uh, so so uh, no, a, a great result for them. And obviously, you know, everybody watching along in India is absolutely ecstatic about it. And they're already uh, uh, coming up with amazing hashtags like Mumbai Falcons to F1 and all this sort of thing. You know, they, they, it, it's, it's built a nice little rapport uh, with the Indian motorsport fan base, which of course is kind of what Formula Regional Asia is designed to do from their point of view. So uh, unfortunate for Hajar and Fonaroli, it would have been nice to see them on the rostrum. And I think Hajar would have a little bit more of an impetus and momentum in terms of the title fight if he'd have kept his second place. Mm, indeed he was. Um, but instead we saw Dina Bogavich take a podium place, Floris, and Eventually, after three rounds in, he seems to have arrived in the championship with some tremendous moves in, uh, in race two when he took the victory. Are you surprised it's taken so long to see Dino match his uh, peers in Formula Regional? Yeah, I think I think that's uh, the key uh, that, that you said why it has taken so long because uh, he always had the promise. He was good in karting. Uh, he was he's in the FDA, not for nothing, of course. He's really talented, but. You know, he was good in F4, but he wasn't like uh, top. Um, and and he started out okay this year, uh, but also still not delivering. But now, from from this round on, he's he's uh, he's he's uh, arrived. You know, uh, he, he got that win, uh, which is very important. So actually, now I think uh, now now I, I think he can maybe even 
challenge for the top. Well, I don't know if anyone can challenge Leclerc, but uh, but still, he can do well. He can maybe finish runner up. Yeah, he's, he's looking at the well, fourth place in the championship. The standings at the moment: Leclerc, 131 points. Marty, 96. Montoya, 92. Dino Boganovic, 88. So he's a way behind, but he'd want to not finish behind the rookies at this rate. That'd be important for him. I would like to talk a little bit, Jake, about F4 as well, uh, in particular penalties, more penalty questions for you. Bit of a baffling end to the weekend. Well, yeah, I wasn't really expecting that finish. And it's weird when you get a motor racing incident that has never happened before. I certainly don't recall any other form of motorsport anywhere in the world where we had that kind of a finish. And it's difficult to talk about it because essentially we'll sum it up really quickly. There was a red flag due to an accident involving uh, Anshul Gandhi, Victoria Blokina and... uh, one other driver whose name escapes me for the moment. That shows you how busy it was over the weekend. Um, <laughs> so uh, we had the red flag incident straight away. Now, normally what F4 UAE drivers are used to is that they'll go to safety car before they go to red flag. Now, when you get a red flag when you're under safety car, you obviously follow the safety car into the pits and form up. But if it's a straight red flag, you have to form up on the starting grid. Now, the only driver who remembered this was Alex Dunn. So Alex Dunn obviously went out to the starting grid. Uh, Andrea Kimi Antonelli, bless him, mistook the situation and went into the pits. And obviously, as a racing driver will do, I'm sure you'll back us up, Gabriel, you're in a tunnel vision. You are following the guy in front of you. You just follow them. And that's not an excuse. That's not basically, you know, saying, well, everybody's allowed to break the rules. No, but when you're in that momentum, you just follow the guy in front and do what they do. So... Everybody ended up going into the pits, except for Alex Dunn. We had some proper Hungara ring flashbacks from last year. Just one car sat on the grid doing nothing. Um, it was very, very unusual. Now, it was difficult because we also had a lot of people on the YouTube stream basically trying to poke fun of the situation. Now, you got to remember that these guys are 15, 16, 17 years old. They're allowed to make mistakes. They're allowed to get it wrong. What was uh, really good from the championship's point of view is they took the situation as it was and thought, okay, yes, they've all made the mistake. Yes, they've broken the rules, but we need to allow a bit of grace. So essentially they punished everybody else by giving them a five second penalty, which didn't actually affect the race too much. It only meant essentially that Alex Dunn was allowed to keep his victory and then everybody else would just finish in the positions that they were in. So at the end of the day, it's a weird one and we will talk about it in years to come I think is one of the more bizarre incidents but I'm glad that the F4 UAE stewards looked at it and went yes okay it's a weird one it's a bit odd but these guys are still learning some of them are still in their very first car racing weekend so let's just allow a little bit of grace let them have that mistake remind them what to do next time and move on and I think it was the right decision yeah I'd want to actually have some impact with that actually or some insight should I say with that Gabriel but you mentioned going to the stewards. Is this the sort of thing that you get briefed on in a driver's briefing beforehand that just to remind you in the event of a red flag, you must do this? Or why do you think this happened in, you know, with everybody going into the pit lane? Guys, to, to be real, like, uh, I think everyone made mistakes, you know, and it's not only because we have a 15, 16, 17 years old. Also, the F1 drivers can make it, you know. Uh, I think... Uh, if you look at the technical and uh, the sport, sporting regulations, like, uh, I don't know, it's a book like this. And I think no, no one read to these books. You know, we read to some articles for sure, like, uh, because it's important to know the rules. But when you are behind someone, you know, uh, you are not expecting to go to the left or to the right. But when you see the guy in front go, going to the right, and if I am behind Kim, I will do the same thing for sure. That's why it's always good to ask your engineer what to do. But in that moment, I think everyone started to follow and uh, everyone went into the pit lanes. And uh, yeah, like I don't remember which race was this. I think it was Sochi in F1 that Hamilton did a practice start out of the, the box that he could. And he got a penalty for that. But man, he's seven times world champion, you know, and uh, he's still getting penalty for this. It's a stupid thing, but at the, at the end, make a difference. But uh, I think the championship did the right decision to get a penalty for everyone because uh, then, as Jake just said, uh, the, the race was not 
even uh, hard gently because uh, everyone got kept his own position, just the race victor that went to Alex. But uh, it's good because now I think everyone is going to pay more attention to the regulations next time. Tough one to learn. Now uh, we'll move on, but just a quick shout out on the F4 UAE that Neat is now in the Champions League by a single point ahead of Charlie Wirtz because of uh, consistency. Consistency is king, as everyone says. And just looking through his campaign so far, absolutely littered with podiums. Um, but that is coming into a really good final two rounds. Floris, can you talk us through some driver announcements that we've had uh, coming out of Van Amersfoort? Yeah, yeah. So Van Amersfoort uh, has announced a, a host of drivers uh, the past few weeks. Um, last few weeks, there was a really interesting one, I think, uh, and it was Franco Colapinto, uh, who's going to do uh, FIA F3 for them. Um, he's, I, you know, in my opinion, he could be uh, the next uh, Argentinian uh, F1 driver. Um, I'm not saying world champion, I don't know, but uh, F1 driver for sure. But in his case, uh, it's again, not only talent, but also finances. And he's having uh, you know, some trouble with that, uh, gathering funds. So I, you should keep an eye on him. Uh, uh, VAR, uh, Van Amersfoort Racing is gonna have a difficult year in, in F3. But um, he's he's going to be uh, he's going to be like up there with the rookies, with the top rookies. Uh, and then you also have, uh, I think, uh, uh, Philip Ugran um, and Nicola Marin Angeli, who are you know Ugran also um, you know maybe a bit underrated, but he had he, he didn't have a great campaign to say the least in uh, in FIA of three, and he. Um, moves back to if i'm right he moves back to uh euro for formula open so he's uh he's taken a step back actually maybe he you know that's something he could have done uh maybe last year first go to ef to efo and then to vr3 but okay uh and and the last one of course um maybe i'm skipping a bit now but uh is is zach o'sullivan who also got announced uh, at carlin uh, in vr3 um, but he also got announced as a, a Williams racing driver, racing academy driver, uh, which is very interesting. Um, but maybe you want to you want to talk about that, Jim? Yeah, well, let's let's go into that. So O'Sullivan's a bit of a headline, actually. Um, I'm going to take it off you, actually. Jake, you're nodding away, um, knowing the sort of talent <laughs> I presume that O'Sullivan's got. Williams taking their academy a bit more serious. We've got Sargent now and now O'Sullivan. That's pretty strong. Yeah, you've got to remember that Williams is essentially building itself back up as a Formula One team. It would always have taken a couple of seasons for them to find their feet in new management. But obviously, after last year, just how strong they were with George Russell and Nicholas Latifi getting some points and getting a podium uh, over the course of last year. We now know that the internal infrastructure at Williams is going well. I actually got to visit the Williams factory just after uh, the takeover and meet the team that were there and you know they really do have uh, a winning aspiration they want to take Williams back to the front and they want to do it with the new trend of Formula One teams in very much the same sort of methodology that we've seen from Alpine that we saw from Racing Point back in 2020 they're really going about this in a modern aspect and I think that's kind of the only thing that really held Williams back as a race team was that they were basically still running their Formula One team a bit too traditional, a bit too Sir Frank, if you like. Uh, now this new entity have come in and they've modernized it. So we are going to see a strengthening of the academy. Logan Sargent is a statement of intent. You know, he is an incredible competitor. He was one of the strongest carters to come out of America that we've seen in the last decade. And he was one of the boys in at Ricky Flynn Motorsport, which you know, the long list of people that have gone through Ricky Flynn and gone on to big things. You've only got to look at Lando Norris and Guan Yu Zhou, who are both now in Formula One. So it's quite clear that Logan is a good opportunity for an American driver to get through. America's a big target market for Formula One at the moment. So it made a lot of sense for Williams to try and give him a chance and take him on. Uh, Zach O'Sullivan is a very, very talented young British driver. He was immense uh, in single seaters last year. And He's only been in car racing a couple of seasons and has already taken a couple of titles. So this kid definitely has, you know, an incredible opportunity to move forward. I think Williams want to grow another homegrown British talent. It kind of fits in with their new 
business model. So I think it will work. And I think he is definitely going to showcase himself uh, over the course of this season as a talent to watch. Plus, you can also see um, that the, the drivers they're bringing in now are, uh, and they're really talented, and they're also younger because, uh, you know, they, they, they had drivers and they have drivers like Nissani, who's 27, uh, Chadwick, who's uh, 23 or 24 years old. So I think they're heading in the right direction. And it's really starting to look like a real F1 driver academy. Everybody is asking a lot of questions, Gabriel uh, and Jake. Uh, everyone seems to be very excited that you guys are on the podcast. We've got a lot of questions to go through. So if anybody does want to ask questions for next week, just drop uh, the hashtag AskF1FS on Twitter. Have a look on Discord, on the official Discord for F1 Feeder Series. You can drop questions in there in the podcast section. And also just on the video, if you're watching on YouTube below, drop a drop a question drop a like and a subscribe as well if you're really feeling generous but on the topic of uh, well van amas what we were speaking about briefly before gabriel one question that came to you from its show time on discord if you had to choose between these f3 teams as a rookie which one are you going to go for and the <laughs> it's show time has asked van amas what shadru campos or jenza which of those four would you want to join I think uh, <laughs> it's quite difficult, but uh, I think Van Aversport have a good uh, have a good history. You know, he, he they were already in F3 European Championship before, and uh, yeah, I think they they will surprise a lot of people this year. Uh, and uh, I think uh, Charles improved quite a lot with uh, Logan uh, in the development of the car, but I think. I think uh, also Franco was basically my teammate last year. Like uh, we had a lot of school, like we know each other. And uh, I think he will do a good job developing the, the F3 FIA car as well. He have a lot of experience and uh, I think I would choose two banana sports. Uh, but all, all these other four teams are really good and a uh, good opportunity for everyone. If they can join FIA F3, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a good opportunity for everyone. Well, I hope to see you there soon. And uh, just follow on from that, another question from Pedro uh, Drogovic S on Twitter. The way to get into, uh, why I'm segueing like this, the way to get into FIA3 will be with some help uh, financially otherwise. But he wants to know, has Air Driver Academy ever contacted you and have you had any negotiations? No, it's, it's not like uh, we sit at the table and start to talk about uh, my future. It's not like this, but uh, for sure, there is um, in the races that I take part. There's a lot of junior drivers, you know, and uh, there is also the boss of the the academies there, and they are looking for everything and for everyone because they don't want to lose for sure a talent driver. Uh, maybe it's before me or after me, you know, and they, they have a look at everything. I never sit with any academy before, no, I didn't. But uh, we had a lot, of, a bit of contact already. But uh, I need to get a, a good result before. I joined an academy and I think um, last year, even if I, I made a really good second part of the year, I still finished in P15 in the championship, you know. I, I got a podium, I was always in the front, but uh, an academy wants a driver that finished in at least the top three in the championships. And, and I think if I, I do a good job this year, I maybe I can, I can have an opportunity to join someone. Well, I hope so too. Uh, get some more victories in, in Freca this time, following from your agent success. Um, it's Charlie Parker, C. Parker on Twitter, and a guest on the first podcast. Wanted to ask Jake, on a scale of one to 10, how shot was your voice after that final F4 UAE race? And how crazy was that <laughs> race? Happy for done and high tech. We talked on it, touched on it briefly. On a scale of one to 10, uh, on a scale of one to 10, it's about 14.7, I think. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was a bit crazy. Um, it was nice to see that, you know, the, the form book was shaken up a little bit again. I mean, yes, we had Premers winning all three races, but there were a few more drivers really starting to get under their skin a little bit more. I mean, we had Luke Browning come in as a whirling dervish this weekend and kind of upset the establishment completely. So uh, he very nearly took a couple of victories off the Premers over the course of the weekend. And it was wonderful. You know, he's only there for the one weekend. Um, and 
it, it's interesting, you know, there, there's this impetus, there's this urgency, I think, from the likes of High Tech GP, from PHM Racing, uh, and particularly from MP Motorsport. They really want to crack this whip and get some wins off Prima now. They really, really want to get under their skin. Floris, I'm going to get you back in with some answers as well, and I'll, get, I'll let you phrase this how you want. So F19 Fortress or F19 Fortress via Discord, what is one driver that has struggled last year that could turn it around this year? And why I'm saying you can choose this, I don't know if we're talking about Formula 2, Formula Regional, just everything. So what's your, what's your pick? You know, uh, I have uh, thought about this. Um, and actually, uh, I was praising uh, Franco Colapinto. And I, I think I'm going to name him because uh, he had a very uh, good first year in, uh, what was it, uh, Formula Ren Renault Euro Cup, I think, still. Um, uh, he, he came third in the championship. And then I thought uh, the next year, so last year in Freca, he, he, he would win the championship. But but he only finished sixth. So uh, but I think uh, with a with a new team in a new series, he can be a t the top rookie next year. Uh, so I, I guess he kind of struggled. I don't know why. He didn't do bad, but I, I expect a little bit more. But he's he's going to come back for sure. And and I also want to name, but I'm still not convinced about this. But uh, Armstrong, uh, nobody expected him to do third year uh, in F2. So he had two just just horrible years with a lot of bad luck uh different teams um but now he gets that like that final chance and maybe he can he can pull a uh, pull a nick to freeze would be awesome for him yeah good good name actually i wouldn't have uh, suspected armstrong but you're right uh, such a surprise to see him going for that third year wish him well going back to you gabriel We've got Alejandro Gill 017 on Discord. I want to know who's the best driver that you've raced against? Yeah, there is there's a lot of good drivers that are raced against. You know, I went into karting in OK Senior, and that was uh, for sure Jake knows uh, really good about it because he 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 saw a lot of good drivers going out and in from karting. And I think uh, racing was Pedro. He was amazing. Like. Pedro Hildebrand, he's an okay professional and uh, KZ and everything. He's a world champion as well. And uh, it was just incredible, you know, because even if he was not fast, he made something to be in the front. I don't know how, but he did it. <laughs> and uh, he was my teammate in TRG. We went uh, out the year really close to each other, you know. I was beating him and he beat me and we were always really close to each other. But uh, I think uh, also in terms of uh, in racing was him, but in speed, pure speed was uh, a bit of uh, Travis Zanuto was not bad as well. He was so fast in, like, in races. He made some quality laps that was amazing. I mean, this is quite ironic uh, that Gabriel has mentioning, the, you know, the best driver he's uh, raced against is Pedro Hillbrand. It's kind of like when Ayrton Senna was asked the same question and he named Terry Fullerton. You know, it, it's interesting how professional racing drivers will refer back to their karting days. And this has always been a constant frustration of mine as the commentator of FIA karting, both European and World Championships. Most of the best drivers in the world are in those two championships. I'm really glad Gabriel's picked up on it because Pedro Hiltbrand is, he is a bit like Schumacher in karting. You know, he has won everything there is to win. And he is still at the top of his game. He is still absolutely incredible. Yeah, that that's perfect because, uh, as you mentioned, uh, karting, it's uh, even better, you say, about racing and everything. And I totally agree with that because uh, karting is pure racing. It's not like formula or something like this. You know? Karting is pure. You just go, start, and give your best and do whatever you can to in the races. And uh, that's true because uh, there is a lot more, less difference in the material between karting and formal, you know? Because if you go to F1, you can't win a race with a Williams, but you can win with a Mercedes. But in karting, you can win with everything. You just need to be really precise and uh, be in the right moment. And uh, I think uh, Pedro did that with uh, all the karting possible, all the chassis and everything. Tony Kart, TRG, Vida Light, he won with everything. That's why I picked him. All right, moving on. AS19 via Discord. Uh, I wanted to know, Gabriel, why did you leave Frack so early? I think you touched on it in the intro, but do you want to just clarify? Yeah, I think uh, my plan 
before I did track was just uh, to do the Freca championship, not even the first two rounds of track. But uh, yeah, the team asked me to do it to get a bit of confidence uh, with the engineer and mechanics and everyone, because uh, I think this is a good opportunity to me in Freca this year with a good team to make a good result. And I need to, when I go to the Freca in the first one, I need to be really ready ready to fight for wins and everything. And I think uh, doing this championship is a good opportunity to, to be ready because for sure, if I was at home sleeping, <laughs> I was not uh, going to be as prepared I'm now. But uh, at the same point, as you asked me why I leave so early, is, uh, yeah, I think for me, I was not even expecting to do the two first rounds. And uh, I'm not fighting for the championship anyway. Uh, I could because I was doing a good job, but, uh, <laughs> but the plan was just to do the first two rounds and uh, to get a bit more, a bit with the team. Well, you shone, shone brightly, and hopefully it's a good, a good omen for the rest of the season with Freca. Um, another question about earlier in the, the form of the Regional Asian Championship was the red flag incident with that Pollock Bassey uh, crash. Jake, how was that to, to commentate over? Uh, Oppie 7407 by Discord Asset, and wanted to add that you did a great job, by the way. Well, thank you very much, first of all. And uh, it was nice to know that we had uh, quite a few people watching along on the Mumbai Falcons YouTube page for that, because um, we actually had uh, two commentary teams managing it uh, for the first weekend. So uh, thank you for listening in. Um, it was an interesting situation because in those sort of problems, you don't really know any information. You're literally just going by what you can see on your screen. And obviously in a situation like that, when an accident is so severe, there's no point in the cameras looking at the incident uh, and looking at the cleanup job because somebody could be hurt, you know, at, at that point. And uh, as much as people want to see what they want to see, at the same time, we also have to think about the safety teams, we have to think about the driver's welfare, and we have to think about the loved ones that are watching them on. So it's a difficult situation, but the good thing is, is that my style of commentary is I'm a bit of a dork. Uh, so I've always, I've always got like- uh, You said it, Jake. I said it, yeah. I describe myself as a bit of a plate spinner of a commentator. I've always got lots and lots of different strands and lots of different tangents uh, to be talking about. So you can still be talking about the tyre regulations. You can be talking about the changes to the Abu Dhabi uh, Yas Marina circuit layout. You can talk about the, the difficulties that drivers have been having in qualifying. There are so many different subject matters that you can go into. And fortunately, I had so many brilliant people watching on the stream, a bit like we're doing now, asking questions. So that obviously fills time as well. And um, I'm one of these people, I really like to interact with the uh, social media community. I think they are uh, the lifeblood of what we do. And, you know, whether we like it or not, as much as we're in motorsport, we're also in show business. We have to give people a show. So I think it's really important that the audience has an active involvement and an active role in it. So I don't think it would have been as good a commentary if I'd had nobody asking me any questions about what was going on, because uh, then we wouldn't have had quite as an entertaining uh, stream. There you have it, everybody. When I say about the hashtag Ask F1FS, uh, don't take it from me. Jake is also saying how important it is for everybody to get involved. We really, really appreciate it. Um, there's actually one question that Floris had a little bit, which is somewhat related to this, Jake, which is talking about commentating over unusual incidents and the Luca Corberi incident in karting with the... <laughs> <laughs> I wondered if this might come up. I wondered if this would come up. <laughs> <laughs> but do you want to talk about, one, what happened for anybody who's unfamiliar and anybody who is unfamiliar, you need to look on YouTube for this. Uh, and two, uh, yeah, yeah what... pretty much any YouTube channel that's got anything to do with racing in any way, shape or form. I think it's done the rounds everywhere. It's yeah. when it ended up in the New York Times... Wow. Uh, social media channel. That's when I realized that we had a bit of a viral moment. Um, but yes, and, and Gabriel Bortoletto will know about this, of course, as well, because obviously being involved in karting at the time. Um, so yeah, Luca Corberi, uh, an FIA World Cup winner in karting, uh, ended up in a bit of an incident uh, during the World Championships at Lenato in 2020 uh, with uh, Paolo Ippolito, who of course was Gabriel's teammate at CRG at one point. Um, they got into a bit of a war of words before the final, and then there was a bit of a, and 
a collision between them during the final. Uh, Luca got incensed and enraged, lost his head for a moment and picked up the front fairing of his car, ripped it off the chassis of the car, waited for Paolo Ippolito to come around again and tried to throw it at him, which is just about the worst possible thing a racing driver can do. You know, unfortunately, it's it, it, it doesn't show the sport in a great light. It doesn't show uh, an athlete in a great light either. And obviously there were uh, there were videos that came to light afterwards uh, of the two of them then brawling. Uh, rather sadly, in the uh, holding area afterwards. What people won't necessarily know is that during the final itself, in between those two incidents, uh, after Corberry was walked away and uh, before the brawl, there there was a point, in, if you can actually watch the final back, there's a point in the commentary where I start to lose my words. I start to stumble over everything. And it's because there was a monumental fight going on behind my commentary box as well, which turned out to be between the two fathers. A bit of a day for all sorts of, you know, chaos and uh, craziness. It's a shame because unfortunately that's now uh, uh, the incident that a lot of people think about when it comes to karting. So the responsibility from our side is to kind of look over the sport, figure out what went wrong, how we fix it, how we put it back together again. And, uh, you know, how we show the sport in a greater light. Um, to actually commentate on it, it was very difficult because I could see Luca holding the front fairing and I could see what he was planning to do. And the thing in the back of your head just says, oh, don't do it. Don't, don't, don't. This is not going to help you, the sport, your team, the nation of Italy, the Lenato. So it, don't do it. Uh, and you're desperately trying to find the right words to say without getting angry you know I'm, I'm a passionate person and i love the sport of karting and i could see what that was going to do to its reputation so you have to try and keep a handle on your words i think i just about managed okay but uh yeah it was pretty emotional and i think pretty much everybody just wanted to uh leave the situation and go home did, did you did you ever uh, uh talk to uh corberry or ippolito after or maybe in the years after I certainly managed to speak to Paolo about it uh, the following year at Adria, and uh, I asked him about it uh, because obviously as a journalist, as well as a commentator, you kind of want to find out what's happening there. And Paolo basically very simply said to me, I don't want to talk about it anymore. You know, it's, it's very, very simple. He's just decided, you know, as far as he's concerned, he's moved on. And since then, Paolo Polito has had actually phenomenal success. You know, last year he won the final at the European Championship, uh, second round of KZ at, Ad at Adria. So he's actually used the whole incident to rebuild himself, to uh, detach himself from the entirety of the incident. And he has completely uh, rebooted. You know, he's become a much stronger driver. And I'm sure Gabriel, who knows him very well, will know. You know, he's a very passionate guy. He's an absolute workaholic. He wants to find what's good about a chassis, what's bad about a chassis. He is a great team player as well. He rallies his team around him. And it's really nice, actually, that something so uh, difficult uh, to be involved with has actually motivated him. You know, he's become a genuine contender. I think he could actually win the world championship this year when we go to Le Mans. I think he's got a genuine chance to do it. Out of uh, bad stuff comes something good, hopefully. <laughs> But yeah, fascinating insight. I really enjoyed that. Um, we'll move on with another question from Twitter. Uh, RSD at Rafael SD42, Gabriel, wants to know, who are your racing idols? In the past, for sure, I think uh, he was the best. In are you allowed to say anybody else as a Brazilian or do you have to say something? <laughs> No, you know this. Uh, as an idol for me, I just I, I not get only one person, and I put like ah, he was the perfect. Like a lot of people in Brazil, I, I know Nelson Pique. I know him. My family knows him. You know, and uh, he was a uh, a lot of also people from outside of Brazil say that he was an amazing technical guy. He could teach an engineer how to engineer a car. You know. And uh, yeah, that was uh, incredible to know because uh, a lot of people say that he was better than Senna in this point. And uh, for sure in this point, it's impressive. And uh, he is my idol about these type of things because it's very important for a driver to know how a car works, not just driving, you know. And Piquet was amazing to doing it. And uh, also his driving style was very good. Senna was... Pure talent and uh, speed. 
Like you could see in qualifying laps that he was one second faster than Prost sometimes. You know, that's crazy. Uh, and they were both best in the world in that time and making this this much difference is amazing that's why i think he's an idol for a lot of people but for now in this in the, in the present i think it's max verstappen for sure i love max like <laughs> it's great but his driving style is crazy like uh he's very aggressive he's uh fast he's young and i think he have a, a brilliant future in front and uh also Hamilton is amazing. He's uh, the idol of a lot of people because he's consistent, you know, because it's, it's difficult to get in the top, but it's, it's even more difficult to maintain in the top. And he did it for a lot of years. But uh, anyway, I, I will support the young driver and uh, the youngest uh, race winner as well, Max Verstappen for the present. Oh, good answers. Um, and to go through on a second question from that, it's showtime of another question, was wanting to know via Discord, Brazil's in a bit of an F1 drought. So you mentioned some excellent names there. PK is often overlooked. But the last Brazilian driver being Pietro for Tapaldi as an emergency substitution. Um, but who do you think has the best shot, Brazilian, of making it into F1 right now? And you can include yourself if you like. Like, uh, there is three Brazilians in front of me in the in types of category. There is Enzo Fittipaldi in F2. There is uh, Felipe Drogovic, that is a close friend of mine. He's very fast. He's very talented. And uh, I think sometimes he's underrated because uh, not everyone talks about him, you know, but he's... Uh, before, uh, also before F2, he was very fast that he didn't put everything together in the right team, in the right moment, you know, but I know him and he is a good shot for Brazil to F1. But as he's going to the 30 in F2, it's not easy because uh, he's also not in a Prima team or Virtuosi anymore. He's in MP and we know that this is not a, it's a good team, but not for winning a championship. And I think to join F1, in like in his conditions is only winning the championship now because he's going to a third year you know and uh, he's one of the most experienced guys and to join F now it, he needs to win the championship and there is also Kaio Collet I think uh, after Drogovic he's my my best shot because uh, Kaio have a good manager behind of him Nicola Stodd and uh, he is a very talented driver as well I think uh he, he have some, if he made a, continue to make good results as he's doing, he can join F1 soon. And me, for sure. <laughs> I need to say myself, you know, because <laughs> uh, I hope so. Uh, everything depends from these uh, next three years that will decide my future in my career, if I will join F1 or not. So if, if you would have to say uh, of those drivers that you named uh, in the next uh, like three years, who's going to make it to F1? If you have to name one person. Uh, me, myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Floris, Floris having the great journalism questions. Got to like, <laughs> the great driver answers. I like that. Um, I'm going to throw it to you, Jake, because we're going to run out of time with this. Uh, so many questions. Thank you, everybody. Um, that. We've got there's quite a bunch of questions. You're gonna pick one of the oh wow. Oh, yeah, yeah, there's there's a lot to go with. Well, let's talk about you though, Jake. Final question from OP7407 by Discord. How did you get into the motorsport media industry and how did you progress to where you are now? Oh wow, okay. Well, this would take quite a while. <laughs> have, I, have I picked the worst question? No, 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 not at all. Uh, fortunately, I am writing a book about it. So if you want the detailed uh, story, then that's hopefully going to be out on sale in the summer. Um, but yeah, to, to cut a long story short, uh, I was actually working as a teenage youth worker. I was working on the streets of Wrexham in North Wales, of all places. And uh, I needed extra income because, uh, unfortunately, uh, public services usually get government funding cuts. So I needed extra work and I just wanted a job that was easy, that I knew how to do and that I wasn't going to have to do too much training. So I went to my local indoor karting circuit and I asked them, have you got any work? And they said, yeah, absolutely. So I was basically doing uh, waving flags as a marshal, uh, cleaning helmets, 
uh, washing suits, uh, scrubbing toilets, you name it, I was doing it. Uh, and I did this for about three months and then said, for our corporate Grand Prix events, we should have a, a commentator. It would probably be very marketable. And they said, oh, that sounds like a good idea. Do you know anyone who could do that? And I said, yes, me. Uh, so <laughs> I basically created the job for myself. We started doing that uh, every Saturday. There would be about three Grand Prix races a day on the Saturday every week. And people would genuinely love it and come back every week. They would come back every week. And we almost kind of created our own little mini championships. And then we had a rally cross, uh, sorry, an autograph club came at the end of the year for a Christmas party. And then they loved it. And they said, what are you doing next year? And I said, well, this, <laughs> basically. And they said, no, 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 come and do it for us. Come and do it for us. And that kind of gave me the confidence to kind of think, well, if they would like me to do it, maybe other people would. So I started uh, going along to places like Alton Park and Silverstone and trying to see if I could work my way into the commentary box. And I happened to meet Ken Walker, voice of karting for many, many years. And uh, he took me under his wing. He taught me everything there was to know about commentating for super karts, which is an amazing sport, uh, even more so than normal karting. And uh, I learned a lot from him. I got talking to Alan Taddei, who was filming the British Karting Championships at that point, And we started doing bits and pieces. I started doing brisker Formula One stock cars, which is another conversation for the book, which will, I'll go into in a lot of detail. Um, but by the end of the year, I had enough video footage to um, send to television companies. And I sent it to everyone I knew. And the only company that messaged me back was Eurosport. Uh, and what followed was a 15 minute meeting and a contract was signed three months later. So, uh, yeah, I literally went from my sofa to Eurosport in less than a year, which is absolutely astonishing. I still don't quite know how I did it. I still don't quite know how I'm doing it. Um, you did, but, you did a yeah. great job, though, Jake. So uh, I think everyone here is well, nodding along. That you, I, ju you I, just, I, just, I, just, I just love it. You know, I, I love the sport. I was never able to be a racing driver myself. We never had any money when I was growing up, and I didn't know anybody in motor racing. And the, it's so much easier, as Gabriel knows, you know, to be a racing driver or to be involved in motor racing when either you have money or you know someone in motor racing. And I didn't have either. So it's been a hard fight, but... I do believe that if you want something, you have to make it happen. You genuinely have to be the one to back yourself. So I fought tooth and nail. Uh, I went to as many meetings as I possibly could go to, as many race events. I would sleep in the back of my car. There was one fabulous incident where I actually had uh, no car, was dropped off by a friend at Silverstone, and I actually fell asleep in the pit garage that was occupied by Toro Rosso the previous week. So uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm that determined. I am that determined. I, I really want to be in racing. I, I don't want to give it up. I want to die with a microphone in my hand at the side of a racetrack, uh, hopefully in my 70s. Uh, so, uh, that, that's, that's kind of what I want to do. And if, if people like it, if people get a kick out of what I'm doing, then I'm doing my job. If, I, if, they, if they're not, then I need to try harder. So just to confirm, you don't want to be standing at the side of a racetrack and have Corberry throwing a front wing at you when you're holding your microphone. That's not how you want to die. Only if I'm in my 80s by that <laughs> <laughs> Someone might have to put me out of my misery by that stage. I don't know. <laughs> well, speaking of putting people out there in misery, everybody listening to this, it's been, a, it's been a great podcast again. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everybody involved in uh, speaking for the last hour or so. So Gabrielle, Jake and Floris, of course, You've been great. We've had some great answers. Uh, as everyone can tell, we need more questions for next week. So let us know the hashtag AskF1FS. Again, it's on Discord as well, or you can just leave a comment on the YouTube channel. Make sure that you're following on Twitter, F1 Feeder Series 1, with a 1 at the end, F1FS Live, and F1FS Americas. Uh, so we've got lots of Twitter stuff to do. And if you haven't already, drop a like on the YouTube channel, follow us, subscribe, do all the usual stuff, and we will see you again next week.